if each of you were the czar of mass transit and transportation in New York City, if there was, and, and the region, there was no pesky legislators like myself to get in your way, if the, you know, you, uh, you, if you ran the MTA and the DOT together, what would your plan be for mass transit for New York City in the future? Because on many occasions when I talk to my colleagues and I get a little bit overheated uh, about some subject, I said, if only I was king, you know, you know, sort of like the, from the Mel Brooks uh, line, it's great being king, you know. Uh, and, and, and so there have been many occasions when I've been able to answer that question in these conversations. If only I was king, then I would do whatever it was I was talking about at the time. There's an awful lot that I would do. Uh, I, one of the things that I would do is I would ban single-family office buildings. You know what a single-family office building is? It's a building built in the suburbs with a parking lot around it, uh, back from a road where it's impossible to even get off a bus and get to the, get to the building. Uh, I would do a lot about changing the land use in the metropolitan area, which would go beyond being the head of the DOT or the MTA. It would be being king. And, uh, and in fact, I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that makes New York so great is that we have the density to be able to support an enormous public transit system so that people here don't need to own cars. They have the choice of owning cars if they want to, but they don't need to own cars. People, only 20% of the households in Manhattan own cars. Only 40% of the people in Brooklyn and Bronx own cars and so on. The fact is that uh, that density it matters, and density makes it makes public transit possible in many different ways. Now, of course, density brings with it uh, some negatives as well. But that I think a lot of that can be handled with better design and the way we design the relationship of our buildings to the street and to the public transit system. And at RPA, we work a lot in suburban communities on transit-oriented development, trying to take advantage of the rail system that we have. I'm going to be out on Long Island tomorrow talking about that in a number of communities on Long Island, or is it in Long Island, on Long Island, I guess, uh, uh, about uh, how to use, uh, use the transit system to, to their advantage. I think that's one of the things I would do. I mean, other than many of the projects that RPA has proposed, like taking advantage of the Second Avenue subway as the fourth uh, great system in the New York City system after the IRT, the BMT, and the, uh, and the IND. Uh, uh, our Metrolink proposal, if you go to our website, you'll see that the Second Avenue subway isn't just a line that runs the length of Manhattan, but it's a line that enables us to give better service to the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn as well. And of course, we're talking about budget gaps now, and the Second Avenue subway is expensive. And you may say, you know, this guy is absolutely nuts to be thinking about billions of dollars being spent on any of these projects. But I remember in the early 90s, when I raised the subject of the Second Avenue subway, even up here on the Upper East Side, uh, people would respond with a Pavlovian giggle. A Pavlovian giggle. You know, ha, 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 that'll never happen. You know, well, it's being dug now. Maybe it's not doing some of the things the right way, but the fact is, it is being done, dug now, and we are going to get the Second Avenue subway at some point. One of the things that I've learned about being a planner for 45 years is the the thing that is the single most important personal characteristic is patience. Uh, RPA proposed a a 1,200-foot rail link in New Jersey called the Montclair Connection in 1929. Two years, only two years after Lindbergh left for Paris, it took 76 years for it to be open. It finally opened in 2000, whatever. The fact is that these things are going to happen. They're going to happen because of the right things. We've got to get people in Queens by the service, people in Brooklyn and Bronx by the service. Third Avenue L was torn down. It wasn't replaced. Uh, we have a line, we have a line, a, a commuter rail line uh, that the Long Island Railroad uses between Jamaica and downtown Brooklyn. It's underused. It should be used for rapid transit, not for the Long Island Railroad. That needs to change. There are many projects that need to be done. There are some less expensive projects that need to be done as well, whether it's bus rapid transit or light rail. We need to do a better job of circulating in midtown Manhattan. And we have to recognize that the transit system is, as I said before, is what makes 
New York possible, and we've got to convince, if we don't have to convince legislators, it'll be a lot much easier to raise the money. But we, also, we, have to, we have to convince the public as well that it's in their best interest to support the public transit system. So I'd ramble a little bit, but it's kind of a question that is meant to be for rambling, isn't it? Yeah been the king of New York City Transit at once. <laughs> Not what quite. would you like to have gotten, what, what else would you like to get done? What I'd like most to get done is a cure for my spinal stenosis so I could ride mass transit. Mm -hmm. Is that awesome? <laughs> That's it. All right. We told these river bridges to create a pot of money that could be used to improve transit uh, and uh, probably uh, with it also modest increases in the current taxes that support the system. Uh, if I uh, wave a wand, uh, I probably uh, I, I share some of Jeff's passion about the Second Avenue subway, but I would like uh, first and foremost for the city to move to a system of bus rapid transit like they have in, uh, in uh, uh, all around the, the, the country, all around the, the world, uh, so that service could go out to a, a lot of neighborhoods that now don't see themselves as having transit as much of an option. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it costs about $10 million a mile for bus rapid transit, it costs a billion miles, a billion dollars a mile for, uh, for heavy rail. So. You know what's going to bring something to a lot of the neighborhoods, and uh, and then I, you know I guess the last thing, uh, and this is uh, you know, the influence of Jane Jacobs. If you read her her books, uh, you know we've had decades of the car eating more and more and more of the public space up uh, until it, until it so dominates uh, in a, a walking city, a beautiful city. Uh, it really uh, diminishes our quality of life. So, you know, uh, th this is something that the mayor has proposed in the 2030 plan and the city department of transportation commissioner is trying to do, which is to create more public plazas, to use more public space for people who walk and bike and roller skate uh, so that uh, their needs are met too. So that's that's something that I would do. And, and it's it's just beginning to happen. I hope to see it come to fruition in my lifetime.